I say hello to all of you. I want you to join me in a celebration of the life of the last speaker. Let's give her a round of applause. In a way, her story is almost like the story I'm about to tell. If you are a pessimist in a, the world we live in today, you are likely to be overwhelmed by the climate of uncertainty in which we live. Let alone the tragedy of her life, but you look at the tearing rage of tsunamis that hit us in the east and tear communities and lives apart and rock up a very mighty nation. You look at the hunger that is tearing up millions of lives of women and children in Africa. You look at the uncertainty and gloom within the global economic environment. You look at the poverty, excruciating poverty, that continues to enslave the lives of billions of people in the world, and you simply are likely to throw in the towel and you say, I give up. And you let the engine of our civilization basically come to a halt. But the story I'm about to tell is more or less like the story of the last speaker, a story that communicates the reason for optimism. It's a story that basically says no adversity is insurmountable. In the gloom that we find ourselves in, there is a reason to hope. Even in our personal private difficulties, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. What we need is always to know what we want and to seek it without late, to have faith in ourselves, to respect and defend our own dignity, and to reach out and build partnerships that can make a change of our present condition. The story I'm about to tell you is the story of my country. In 1994, the country collapsed, were hit by a genocide that claimed the lives of a million people in 100 days. That means about 10,000 people were being killed every day, about seven every minute, for a straight, unrelenting program that lasted 100 days. At that time, we thought that our world was finished. The world looked away, and we were faced by this terrible challenge. And we thought we would never get out of it. It's not just the people that died, but the whole country, machinery, social, economic, and political fabric collapsed. About three and a half million people went into exile after, after uh, perpetrating the genocide or performing the genocide. We had a million people dead. We had about three and a half, three and a half million people, 400, rather four million people, to deal with the aftermath of the genocide. And as the genocide was going on, the whole world simply turned away. Either in shock or in shame, but the Rwandese were left to stop the genocide and to deal with the aftermath of the genocide. The debates going on at the time was that this particular event, this tragedy, would hold us captive that we would never get out of this particular terrible condition that genocide had left us in. And I'd like to share with you a bit of the feeling of what the time was in the next video clip. Thank 
Retrospectively, the 1994 genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi appears as one of the strangest phenomena of the late 20th century. During that atrocity, characterized as one of the unspeakable horrors of the last century, wherein only a hundred days, about 1,174,000 people were killed. This amounts to 10,000 people murdered every day, 400 every hour, 7 every minute. Thousands of widows, many of whom were submitted to rape, are now HIV positive. There are about 400,000 orphans that were left after the genocide. The genocide happened. It took tremendous amount of courage to stop the genocide. The group of these brave Rwandan young people, led by our current president Paul Kagame, that decided to take on the genocidal forces, had limited resources, but they had as a resolve. They had a positive attitude to challenge this atrocity to face, to look the devil in the eye and say no to inhumanity, no to dictatorship, no to impunity. And even though they stopped the genocide, they had the biggest challenge of trying to rebuild the country, to build a nation out of this utter desolation, to try and do it with limited experience, to try and do it with limited resources, and to do it with you know, a disinterested world that had watched the genocide happen and that was not particularly very keen to jump in and clean the mess that had happened. And these young people, because they were very young, the current president of Rwanda is about my age, mate. He was about 35 when this was going on. He confronted the devil with his men and stop the genocide and then try to get into rebuilding the country. At the time, the world did not feel that Rwanda would stop being a basket case. We had sunk as low as any other you know, human society had ever sunk. Perhaps no, experience, no other country has had that experience over the last 40 years. And it was not possible to imagine that we would be able to get out of the abyss into which we had sunk. So it took a lot of courage and a lot of positive attitude to try and rebuild a nation out of the desolation that we had found ourselves in. Which takes me back to the story that we're telling, that no adversity is insurmountable as long as you have the right attitude, you have the right commitment. And out of the genocide that happened out of the desolation that we inherited, a nation was born. It was born because those that stopped the genocide knew they had to do three important things. One, they had to build security and ensure that there is peace. They had to reconcile the nation and build the right institutions. And they had to try and begin to empower the people and make them the central focus of their governance and empower the private sector as drivers of the economy. Now, the result of these particular interventions that they engaged in, in trying to rebuild this country is also captured in the next video clip. Fifteen years ago, in Rwanda, over a million innocent people were killed in just 100 days. The victims were Tutsis and moderate Hutus, all Rwandans. They were men and women, they were parents and children, they were young and old. The killing was merciless and unforgiving. For those 100 days, one person was murdered every 10 seconds. Whole families were wiped out, communities destroyed, a country left in ruins. Thousands of women were raped, countless children witnessed atrocities their young eyes should never have had to see. 
The genocide not only wiped out a generation, it smashed the dreams of all Rwandans to live as one in peace and prosperity. The perpetrators of the genocide believed that by elevating division over unity and sowing hatred instead of hope, they could change the course of Rwanda's history forever. Today we know that they failed. 15 years after the genocide, Rwanda is a country transformed. Under the formidable leadership of President Paul Kagame, it has become a role model for Africa and an inspiration to the world. It's one of the most stable, least corrupt countries in Africa. Roads are paved, schools and hospitals built, and jobs created. Last year, the economy grew by over 10%, and a country that was once a no-go area attracted more than a million visitors in 2008. Rwanda has still a long way to go, and it has an ambitious vision, which the Rwandans will have to work hard to achieve. But they are heading in the right direction. Once seen as a basket case and endowed with few natural resources by the ingenuity of its people, Rwanda has shown that development is possible. It has pledged to end its dependency on foreign aid. It has become a leading player in the East African community. Rwandan soldiers are helping to keep the peace in Darfur. We must never forget the past. A generation of children need to learn about the mistakes of the past so that they do not grow up to repeat them. And the international community that failed Rwanda so badly in 1994 needs to be reminded that when it says never again, it has to mean it. But thanks to the hard work, determination and compassion of its people, Rwanda can once again face the future with confidence. Tony Blair captures the transition from genocide to the present Rwanda in a very succinct way. From being a basket case, good leadership, very good thinking, very effective execution of plans, a clear vision that was pursued passionately has been able to translate chaos, to translate hell into fully fledged palpable national renewal. And what this has taught us is that with good leadership, no adversity is insurmountable, as long as the adversity is in conflict with the public interest. Over the last 17 years, Rwanda as a nation has chosen, chooses to remember. Every year we remember the genocide. But we've also made a decision. We've made a decision to remember, but to say no to indignity and yes to humanity. To say no to the reign of bloodhounds that plunged our country into self-destructive mode and say yes to brotherhood. We've also learned that to move forward, we must be able to say no and bravely say no to chaos and preach compassion and care. And to be able to say that leadership isn't about the leaders, but leadership is about the people. Today, 98% of all school-going children in Rwanda are in school. Today, 98% of all Rwandans have access to medical health care. Today, Rwanda leads the world as the best country that has empowered women as active participants in the political process. 56% of our members of parliament are women. <laughs> Last year, Rwanda was voted the best reformer, pro-business reformer in the world, not in Africa, in terms of creating an enabling climate for ease of doing business. This year, 
we jo Rwanda joined the Commonwealth last year. But this year, Rwanda was later rated as the second best country in Africa where girls should be born. <laughs> Today, Kigali, which was 17 years ago, a field of dead bodies and blood and a stench of death is rated as the cleanest city in the whole of Africa. All this has been possible simply because of the importance of good leadership, the unrelenting pursuit of that, that you know, what, what builds and adds value to human life, of a deliberate refusal to accept that your condition must hold you down, and a commitment to confront any adversity if it threatens to hold you down. We do not share this experience because we want to preach or to even promote Rwanda. We share this experience of Rwanda's transition from hell to renewal, from dictatorship to people empowerment, to poverty to robust economic growth, to enslavement of women to empowerment of women. We want to share this so that maybe other people may be able to draw lessons from our experience. And I thank you all, I thank TEDx for giving us the opportunity to share this moment. And if you allow me, I'd like to end by showing you another video clip that shows where Rwanda is today. Thank you. Land of a thousand hills and a million smiles comes a global welcome to the new Rwanda, a country with a vision to be world class. Rwanda's story is one of resurgence and renewal, a country once on the brink of collapse, now transformed with a new spirit and vision of economic development. We have made tremendous progress in Rwanda in building political value systems that in turn provide an enabling environment for development. It's a Rwanda with a new generation of leaders, committed, qualified, with zero tolerance for corruption. You produced your own leadership and have raised this country from what we call in the Bible uh, a valley of dry bones. And now you have made these bones live. Rwanda is one of the most well-organized, disciplined, forward-looking places, not just in Africa, but among all the developing countries in the world. There's virtually no crime, no fear, only sheer beauty. Rwanda is a totally peaceful, wonderful place that you really need to see to believe. The new Rwanda is an exciting tourist destination. From five-star luxury hotels in the city to awe-inspiring mountains with rare gorillas in the mist. But one of them came towards me and just grabbed my arm slightly and then he kind of let go and rolled off down the hill. It's a land rich in natural resources, producing many of the world's best coffees and finest teas. A land ripe for investment. Welcome to the land of opportunity. Progress, peace, and political stability. Embrace Rwanda, a country on the move. Experience its rebirth, its revival, its renaissance.